welcome to another episode of Let's Talk, exploring the issues affecting all of our lives. I'm your host, Austin Harris. On today's episode, we return to Parliament at the first meeting of the 2022-2023 session, which was marred by controversy and heavy-handed politics that led to a member's boycott and concluded with the resignation of the Speaker of Parliament. With us today to dissect the proceedings and the ultimate outcome, it is our pleasure to welcome back in studios the Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Roy McTaggart. Welcome back, Mr. McTaggart. It certainly was another unconventional meeting of Parliament. Would you agree? I would have to agree with you. And, uh, you know, it's amazing what, uh, what emerges and the way things play out these days in, in Parliament. And yes. It was an interesting time, no, no doubt about it. Uh, the Parliament sat for two days mm -hmm. to accomplish its work. But it was not marred. It was marred by the opposition sitting out uh, the session entirely. Yes. Well, perhaps you can walk us through uh, and our audiences uh, some of the final points that led to the opposition's boycott of that meeting. Sure. Well, the, the decision really to boycott the the meeting came down to the the deputy speaker's refusal of my motion of no confidence yep. in the speaker. Mm -hmm. That was the straw that broke the camel's back, yes. you know, proverbially. Yes. Uh, to be honest with you, Austin, I, I had given up really on our being able to, uh, to do anything about it uh, because we had gotten to the point where, you know, um, Parliament was starting on the Wednesday and we had met, we'd set the uh, agenda and everything was done. Our motion of no confidence in the government was slated to be heard first yes. on on that Wednesday, and then on Thursday we got notice that uh, that the government had persuaded the speaker to delay it by Parliament by two days. Yes. And uh, what came out next was late Thursday evening was a motion of confidence being brought by the government bench uh, yes. back bench a motion of confidence in the government. So we knew what their game plan then was. But that told me as well that we also had an opportunity because Austin, we waited and we waited and we waited in terms of this whole issue of the speaker and his need for him to step aside. Yes. And that delay gave us an opportunity then to bring that motion of no confidence. So for me, it really was a matter of principle because the premier should have been doing this, not yes. me. Yeah. And it was his responsibility to bring such a motion to remove the speaker, but he wouldn't do it, didn't do it. So I acted and that's what it was for me. So on the Friday afternoon, we filed a motion of no confidence. And lo and behold, we find that when it was considered by the, the deputy speaker, because it couldn't have been considered by the, the speaker himself because it concerned him. There would have been a, made a very a, a strong conflict there. So he was hopelessly conflicted. So it went to the deputy uh, speaker and uh, she wrote on the Wednesday and, uh, and gave me reasons as to why she had done so. And mm. the reason she gave was that she said it was out of time. Right. Well, we don't believe it was out of time. We think that was a very dubious and incorrect reasoning and rationale for doing so. Mm. And I called her out on it in a response and I asked her to reconsider. And, uh, you know, there was just deafening silence. There was never a response from her with regard to it. And I, see. I suspect they know. Yes. They very well knew. At the very least, she should have maybe consulted with the Premier, who's an attorney, and would have been able to advise her on what the proper interpretation of the standing orders and the interpretation law would have, uh, would have been. And the Speaker did as well. She gave the correct answer when she told us that the deadline for filing of the motions was Friday afternoon at five o'clock. We filed it long before five o'clock on Friday. Yeah. Uh, so there was a lot of shenanigans going on that were played throughout Indeed. that whole process. But for us, ultimately, the decision to stay at, out of Parliament was one of a principle. We had to stand against that, you know, just no, no change and, and one of trying to uh, show our displeasure that we just cannot continue with the same old business as usual with regard to the behavior of, uh, of the former speaker. 
Indeed. Now, it's certainly you've spoken about this point before, about the relative inexperience of members on the PACT administration, and certainly that includes uh, the Deputy Speaker. Um, but in an effort to help remove that inexperience and provide certainly a, a, a guide map, that's what the standing orders are. And Standing Order 24-5 you know, clearly sets out the timeline for motions, and there is no ambiguity. So she was wrong. Well, I, bottom line is, yes, you're right, she was wrong. And at the very least, she ought to have consulted with the, uh, with the advisor to Parliament being the Attorney General. Uh, but it would appear to me as if that was not done and she acted, you know, on her own. And I would surmise, I guess, if I could say so, that she did so in consultation with the, with the uh, Premier and he was probably complicit. Yeah, indeed. Now, again, um, you know, the decision by the Deputy Speaker to deny the motion of no confidence in the Speaker um, on the grounds that we've just covered was a reason for the boycott, but um, you also were quoted as calling the proceedings of the day a sham. Um, why such strong language? Well, I, 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 I felt it necessary, given the strong-handed way in which the, the government members had behaved uh, <laughs> when it came to handling our motions and their efforts to derail them, and let's be honest here, brutally yeah. honest here, they were successful yes. in doing so, that it, it really made a sham and a mockery of, uh, of the whole parliamentary system. You know, you can read within the Bible of par parliamentary procedure, Erskine May, and it talks about motions of no confidence and the importance of them being heard in Parliament, not just being heard, but being heard very quickly, that it should be given prominence. And uh, they, served, they, they tried and they were successful in, in reducing that and eliminating that completely. So what I would say is, yes, the, uh, the, the opposition, we were completely blunted and silenced, really, uh, by the actions of, uh, of the government. All right. Um, Mr. McTaggart, you were further quoted in the media uh, as stating, and I quote, that under this government, a PAC government, we are rapidly becoming a kangaroo parliament and a violation of all democratic principles of parliament. You further charge the PAC administration of bullying and being heavy-handed in their controversial decision to replace, as you stated, the opposition motion of no confidence in the government uh, with what many have said is an unprecedented um, a motion of confidence in the government by the government. Yeah. You can't make this stuff up. Talk to us about uh, you know uh, that unprecedented motion and certainly uh, uh, the sense that you received as an opposition in that um, replacing order because certainly motions of no confidence are treated traditionally, you mentioned Erskine May, as a priority because of the subject matter. Yeah, and you're dead right, Austin. Um, and that's why I, I talk about those things, and I use that very strong language uh, with that regard, because they use their sheer numbers in the business committee to achieve their own agenda and to stymie the, uh, the opposition. And that is never good politics at the end of the day, Austin. Yeah. Um, the, I always agree, and we, I uh, always remember uh, some of my colleagues in form previous governments, particularly Mr. Arden McLean, who he always had a saying, the government, that the opposition must have its say, mm -hmm. but the government will have its way. Yes. We understand that, but you, it's never good politics, just simply stymie and silence an opposition. That is effectively what they did by putting their motion of confidence in the government first, because mm -hmm. it, it, it rendered our motion uh, almost to the point of uselessness. Sure. Um, in in terms of achieving what we what we wanted, I mean, there are no real uh, consequences for that motion of confidence in the government because immediately you know every one of them were going to be voting for it. Mm -hmm. But a motion of no confidence could have had some really serious consequences, and I suspect that that is something that they were quite worried about or afraid of. Yeah. Uh, because we know now 
that when, once the motion was, was, was filed, that the Premier set about very quickly to try and rally his troops together, all of his government together, and try to restore some sense of, of cooperation and unity amongst them. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how long it lasts yes. and where it does end up. At the end of the day, if the, if the effect of it all is that they do co have come together and can truly put their differences aside and uh, work together for the betterment of the country and last out the remaining term, more power to them. Yes. That's what I think no one really wants to see a government fail. And, and you know, that in itself brings, uh, you know, a real negative uh, feelings and consequences, I think, to a country in the way it is, is viewed, that you get a false, uh, a, a government that actually fails and falls. That, that's never really good. Nobody really wants that. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, certainly, um, while your motion of no confidence in the government uh, failed to hit its mark, I think your steadfast, when I say you're the opposition, steadfast refusal to participate in the meetings and the principal position upon which you took, that is that members of parliament should conduct themselves as an example to others, I think um, was certainly viewed favorably within the public domain. Um, and certainly your refusal to participate ironically, ultimately led to the Speaker's um, final resignation. Uh, initially, he gave himself 60 days to leave office, which, of course, um, you would not have. And then before the meeting concluded, uh, it was a resignation with immediate effect. Uh, again, uh, talk to us about, uh, first of all, your decision to, to move out, uh, to not participate, and certainly the impact it had on the speaker's ultimate resignation? Well, you know, our decision not to participate was not taken very lightly. Yeah. But we, we felt, and I felt personally, that, uh, that it was best that we do so when I saw on that Friday morning that the speaker was taking the seat. We sat around waiting and to see who would actually be in the chair on that morning. And Austin, I had every expectations that, that it might be, you know, the deputy speaker, that she would take the chair. And but when I saw that, I just asked my colleagues, look, you know, I said to them, you know, we really can't go in here and, just, and, and, and do that and support that. Just business as usual. Something needs to change. And we needed to, to register our disquiet and our opposition to this in the most strenuous and strongest way that I could. And I felt that <clears throat> it really... The, the strongest way that we could do it and best way to do it would be to just boycott it because to me it had it it's more than just politicking it, it was it was a matter of principle yes that we just could not continue as we had and i said that several times leading up to the meeting when all of this started to unfold uh we just cannot continue and have business as usual change needed to happen and i honestly i'm glad that that is the case now and that, yes, ultimately, the Speaker did see and, and recognize that and, and give his resignation. So I, I'm, I'm grateful for the changes that have taken place. And, you know, as a legislator, I'm looking forward to the next sitting when we will elect or the, the Speaker's successor. Indeed. Um, sir, I think it's fair to say that, um, whether it be the blogs or social media, that the public sentiment was largely in support of the opposition's principled position to boycott uh, Parliament. However, there have been some critics, um, including the government, who have suggested the opposition um, was being hypocritical in their position, um, and it was less about principles and more about hypocrisy. How would you respond to those critics? Well, Austin, I think the criticisms that they're levying go back to 20, are going back to 2020, when we had the issue as well again with the with the then with the speaker. Yes. Uh, similar, um, you know, accusations. In that case, he was actually uh, you know charged and and uh, pleaded guilty. So I think that's what they are referring to. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember, we did act. And at the end of the day, the decision then 
based on what we knew and what was, was taking place, felt it best to put the question then back into the hands of the public mm. and, and the voters, really. And so we decided to end our term early in order to give the public that opportunity. Nothing hypocritical about that. Yeah. Um, you know, what is hypocritical very clearly are the statements made by the Premier and men members of, particularly him, let's just say limited there, uh, that he made at the time with regard to it and his actions now with regard to the, the, the speaker and in that he took no action whatsoever and remained silent throughout the entire process of, of his uh, you know, you know, final days in Parliament and opportunity then to bring a motion to, uh, to remove him from office and refused to do it and, uh, and, and stymied our motion. Yes, with regard sir. to it. So I don't see any hypocrisy there at all. Uh, I would just remind everyone really too that, that uh, you know, I'm now the leader of the progressives and I, I bring my own style and I bring my own, uh, you know, way of doing things to, yeah. to, the, to, this, to this whole process of that we call politics. And I've, I've got a very capable and able deputy as well. Indeed. And we work together as a team and uh, you know, that these were things that are, are we collectively decisions that we made and, uh, you know, executed on them. Indeed. And if I may add your background and character, uh, art to this day, beyond reproach. Thank you. So, Mr. McTaggart, what happens next? First, with regards to the speaker's position, and secondly, with regards to the remainder of this present government's term in office. Uh, will the opposition now uh, try to strike a balance and continue to work with the government as the opposition in you know, finishing this administrative term? Well, good question, Austin. Um, you know, in terms of the way forward now, the next step really when, the, when Parliament meets, then the first order of business will be to elect a new speaker. Yeah. So that will be done. But as uh, an opposition, we will continue to be an opposition not just for opposition's sake, but to present an al the alternative uh, to, to the government. So yes, we will work with them uh, on things that we believe are right, and there are things that we will, as an opposition, should criticize and oppose. That's the nature of our parliamentary system. Yes. But absolutely certain, I mean, we will do so. And, and you know, we've seen how we have demonstrated our working with the government. They brought many pieces of legislation which we had no comments on, we just said to go, we support it, and it just sails right through Parliament. Right. I'm not there, you know, we're not going to go in there and just to make noise or to speak just for the sake of doing so. If we've got things that are substantive and need to be said, mm -hmm. we're going to say it. Right. And we are going to argue our points quite strongly. Uh, so what can the government expect? They can expect a very vibrant opposition. We'll continue to do our work and continue to do our job. And... Uh, and we'll go from there and then we, you know, we look forward to 2025 too. Indeed. That time period, it's, you know, two and a half years away, but that time goes very quickly because mm. we are just at the halfway point through this government's tenure. Mm. Now, albeit you did boycott the last meeting, there were a raft of uh, different motions, bills that were brought to the House. Um, were there any uh, matters, business of, of, of Parliament brought uh, that the opposition saw as object objectionable? None, of, none that, that uh, were absolutely objectionable to us. There were things we would have argued for or asked to be done differently. Right. Uh, in particular, the, you know, the financial assistance bill. Um, we really would have liked to have seen the, um, the draft uh, regulations as they existed yeah. uh, before, you know, before actually voting on the bill because as it was, the bill itself was very sparse. It was, it was a very good framework. Yes. Uh, we all felt that. Uh, but we would have liked to have seen more and give it more substance, understand what, what, the, um, what the rules and regulations would be in, and how it might, was likely to operate. Right. And I think that, uh, that part of it we would like to have seen, but I don't think we certainly would not have opposed that. There was no, no legislation there we would have outright opposed. Mm. The other piece of legislation, the amendment to the traffic law, which, which lowered the, the legal age for, uh, for, not the legal age, the, um, the, the 
legal limit. Legal limits mm -hmm. for uh, you know driving while it's intoxicated. Yes. Um, I had put forward a um, a an amendment um, to the law to it, the, the government brought it down to zero point zero seven percent mm -hmm. blood alcohol level. I had put forward an amendment to go back up to 0 0.08. And I did that because, first of all, Keman was a real outlier at where it was at 0.1%. Yeah. We, are, are we were off the scale there, about the only one in the world with it at that level uh, anymore. Um, I felt that 0.7, probably 0.07%, went a little bit low because mm -hmm. I couldn't find very many countries at that level. In fact, when I looked, and I, I spent a couple hours on the internet searching, uh, I could only find uh, Honduras mm -hmm. as one country that had 0.07%. may have been others, I, yes. I don't know. Right. Um, and when I looked at it, the vast majority of the, <coughs> of the developed and industrialized world, US, Canada, um, UK, whole bunch raft of other countries were all at 0.08 right. and so I felt that was probably the the the, the right amount of where, where it should be uh, but anyway it you know 0 0.07 percent I, I wasn't going to not uh, support it yes. if I didn't get my uh, you know get my way with it I would gladly have supported it because I felt we were so far you know in one corner, mm -hmm. and I was never really comfortable with it in, in recent times. Uh, just felt it, it, it does, did need it did and does need to change. Sure, and well, so I'm glad glad for the premier bringing it and and, uh, and and getting it done. Indeed, and to your point, you know, depending on a person's constitution, 0 0.07 is relatively two, maybe three beers. Yeah. Uh, so we can anticipate uh, a lot more roadblocks. Um, given these new otherwise guidelines that the police have to work with. But yeah. um, again, it's a safety issue, and I think we all will agree we have far too many deaths on the road as it is. So as again, is. something that would otherwise get the opposition. And I, I agree with you completely on that, uh, Austin. There's no way I could you yeah. know, argue otherwise. Right. Um, something needed to change, and I'm glad that we, we, we got it done. And I think, you know, uh, once they, the police, you know, once it's brought into to law, which I think it'll probably come in, into effect uh, very quickly, yeah. uh, then the uh, you know the police do have a, a more of a weapon now to go after people, and it, it'll only take a few uh, few uh, charges and convictions mm -hmm. that uh, that I believe you will see a, a real change in, in people's behaviours. Absolutely, and that that needs to happen. If that accomplishes it, then. So be it. Indeed. It and again, to, to the audience, I think it's a fantastic example of what you said earlier on, that as an opposition, you're not going to oppose for opposition's sake. If it's yeah. a good idea, it's a good idea, and it's going to have the support of the, uh, of the opposition. Uh, finally, Mr. Leader, uh, there's a lot of talk on the street, obviously, about who you know, the Speaker's replacement will be. Uh, from a procedural standpoint, does the opposition have any say in all of that, or will it be a matter for the government to decide and then the House, uh, Parliament will have to take a vote on it. Well, I mean, the lead has to be taken by the government, uh, and, and they will, no doubt. So when we come to the House, um, you know, th they will put forward their, their nominee to the, uh, to the, you know, to the House. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, they, they, from the chair, whoever's sitting in the chair, the Deputy Speaker, yeah. she will also call for other nominations in addition to the government. So the opposition as well will have an opportunity to put forward a nominee. Now, exactly. I have not discussed any of this with my colleagues uh, as to where we are and what we might do. Right. I think we just wait to see who the government brings forward. And, you know, there's, so there are a number of moving parts here mm -hmm. that, uh, that have to come together before you see where and how this all takes place. But, you know, it will be interesting again. I mean, if you remember correctly, back when um, the, when we were all sworn in and, yeah. and, and the, uh, and the vote was taking place to for the speaker, and Mr. Bush was proposed. I, I actually got up and nominated Miss Miss Barbara Connolly yes. as a speaker, and I did like that failed, and I again put her forward for deputy speaker, and and that failed. Mm -hmm. But we had that opportunity, yes, and yes. there was a, a proper vote that took place, and and so democracy was seen at its finest. It it did right. its work. All right, indeed, well, Mr. McTaggart, I want to thank you again uh, for taking the time to join us and certainly share. 
uh, your perspective on the proceedings of the first meeting of Parliament for the 2022-2023 session. Um, hopefully the second meeting will be less controversial, but uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity for some closing comments at this time. Well, I certainly thank you for taking the time to interview me with regard to, to these matters, Austin. I've heard the criticisms and uh, I hope I've been able to set the record straight uh, with to the public and with regard to our views and what happened and, uh, and why they took place. And I hope they understand the reasons why we did so. I mean, that is critical and that is important. Uh, for the public to understand, I don't take my I take my job seriously, yes. and I don't um, I don't do things on a whim, and I willy nilly. I think them through, and I think them through clearly and properly before I make a decision to do what I do. And uh, I felt in the times and the circumstances that it warranted a very response from the opposition in the strongest of terms. Indeed. And uh, hey, look at what we accomplished. Absolutely, and indeed. I don't have a problem taking credit for it. Mm. Uh, because we have beat this drum for a long time and uh, it has resulted in in accomplishing what we thought was needed yes. within the parliament uh, for it in terms of its stability and its future uh, operations. I also want the public to understand and appreciate that it became clear to us as time passed that the speaker was not going to do as he had been invited to do by Mr. by the Premier, mm. who had written to him, given him a deadline, that deadline come and pass, and there was no action, no word, nothing, dead silence, radio silence from the Premier, that it needed a response from us. This was an issue that really the Premier was the one who would be responsible for acting and doing what he did. And he neglected that. He did not do what he should have done. And so I felt as the opposition, if he wouldn't do it, then it would become my responsibility or to do just that for him mm -hmm. and force the issue. And that was to uh, bring about that vote of no confidence in the speaker. So Absolutely. Well, certainly I know uh, from experience that the decision to uh, boycott any meeting is never taken lightly and is never an easy decision. Um, but in this instance, certainly it served its purpose. Uh, and in the end, uh, the desired result um, happened. And again, we thank you very much for taking the time. I think the discussion has been very informative. And I think the public certainly did deserve to hear the opposition side uh, of this conversation. And they certainly have had that opportunity here today. So again, thank you very much for being our guest in studios. Thank you, too. Pleasure. Indeed. Indeed. And to our listening audiences, as always, uh, we say thank you for taking the time to tune in and hope you enjoyed today's conversation and our guest as much as we did. If you did, remember to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Uh, and if there's a discussion you would like us to present here on Let's Talk, please feel free to leave those suggestions in your comments. Please remember to tune in every Tuesday and Thursday at 4 p.m. for another episode of Let's Talk, exploring the issues affecting all of our lives. I'm your host, Austin Harris. Until next time.